Well, welcome everyone. I'm Doug Bradburn. I'm the President and CEO of George Washington's Mount Vernon, and it's great to see you again here on this members-only live stream. I hope everyone is making the best of a wonderful season. Uh, and we've had a great number of shows together this year. This will be my last uh, sharing some time with you before the end of the year, but never fear. Uh, we have lots of other programming coming together for you. I think things are looking up, especially with today's news of the vaccine distribution, and, and it will set the stage for a strong 2021. In the meantime, people remain safe out there. But I have some great ideas for you to plan for New Year's Eve. I know you can't go anywhere, can't go to that big party that you're planning, uh, but what you can do is join Mount Vernon in watching a PBS special that'll air all over the country called United in Song on PBS with Patti LaBelle, Renee Fleming, Joshua Bell, Denise Graves, and uh, many other wonderful musicians. Yo-Yo Ma was featured as well. We filmed this special show at Mount Vernon. Uh, we shot fireworks off at the end of it, and it'll air, as you can see on this uh, uh, link here, mountvernon.org, go to PBS. You can see where your local PBS station is and when it will air. Uh, and you should make sure you have a bottle of champagne that you can raise and raise a glass to George Washington and the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. If you're local, we're gonna have dinners you can purchase here at Mount Vernon to pick up and, and share together as well. So tonight we're gonna get a little bit into that festive mood. I wanna talk about, um, wine and hospitality uh, with one of the experts uh, in the area. I want you to pour yourself a glass of wine and we'll raise it and talk about how presidents used to imbibe, to have dinner parties, to celebrate, to do diplomacy in the White House through history. Given to us by a brand new book by Fred Ryan. Fred is the publisher and CEO of the Washington Post. He's been an aficionado of both wine and White House history for most of his life. He served in a senior staff position in the Reagan White House and is Reagan's post-presidential chief of staff. He currently serves as chair of the board of directors of the White House Historical Association and also the board of trustees of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation of the Wine Committee of the Metropolitan Club of Washington, D.C. The confluence of these experiences come together in his incredible book, Wine and the White House, Please welcome Fred. Thank you, Doug. It's great to be with you. <clears throat> Fred, it's a tremendous book. I want to give people a sense of the heft of this thing. Uh, this is a serious cocktail table book. It weighs five and a half pounds, so you can get your, your workout, Doug, even at home. Well, I, I think, you know, you and I were saying it's a perfect gift for the people who love history and love wine. Well, it was that that's what kind of led me to to get involved in this. It was the opportunity to write about the intersection of two areas uh, that, uh, as you mentioned, have great interest, wine and history and uh, and and particularly presidential history. And the, the more I got in, into it, the more I learned. And since there hadn't been a book in this area before, uh, I kept going and figured might as well make it the comprehensive, definitive version since there isn't another one. So it uh, it ended up to be pretty extensive. But it's besides being hefty, as you can see from holding it, we also wanted it to be fun. So as you've noticed, there are a lot of little quotes and anecdotes and toasts and things that people can use in their, their daily lives. It's filled with beautiful, spectacular pictures. It's filled with great stories of wine and uh, and dining. And I have to say, I, I immediately had to go crack open a bottle of wine once I was three pages into this thing. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, it's it, tantalizing. It's been known to do that to people. It's, it's <laughs> best to open the book and a bottle of wine at the same time. See it's which fantastic. one you first. And now I know that uh, this book is uh, a labor of love for you, but it's also a little piece of philanthropic work as well, because every copy of this book that's sold goes to support the White House Historical Association. Yes, it, uh, the White House Historical Association, as you know, uh, has two missions. One is to acquire important pieces for the White House, but the other more broad mission is to educate the public about the White House as an institution, not from a political standpoint, but from a, just a standpoint of the importance as, as one of our institutions of democracy. And uh, I'm just pleased with this book. We were able to underwrite every expense in producing it. So when someone buys a copy, every cent goes to educational efforts about the public uh, interest in the White House. 
Well, that's fantastic. I encourage everybody here to take a look at the White House Historical Association's webpage. There it is for you there and uh, take a look at their programming, their memberships, what's going on there. It's an interesting uh, nonprofit because it was started by Jackie Kennedy. That's right. And, and, you know, when when she was in the White House, as you know, as you know, uh, up until that time, the the decor of the White House would change a lot. And yeah. uh, and even earlier, back in the turn of the 20th century, they would essentially have have tag sales and they would move furniture out and then the next <laughs> president would move in. And, and she began a very aggressive campaign to acquire important historical pieces of furniture, of art, of fine art. And uh, and that. That was the beginning of the Historical Association mm -hmm. to serve as the organization that would help do that and to begin to, uh, to, to educate the public about the White House itself. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Yeah, the presidents would just take their furniture when they left and then the new suite would come in. It was like the, the Clampets coming to town, right. Beverly Hillbillies, <laughs> right. and God knows what. But I know Ruth B. Hayes' you know, presidential house has like all the furniture from Hayes's uh Hayes's time in the White House they, they would pack it up they would take the china they'd take the uh, the glassware the wine uh really everything would change during administrations but as you know now that's all been changed uh, anything yeah. in the White House remains in the White House collection even if it's not being displayed at the moment yeah it's interesting it's a fascinating story and you'll get some of that in this book as well so let's let's talk about you quickly uh so the interest in history and the interest in wine I presume the interest in history came a little earlier, maybe uh, before you were of a drinking age. Talk about that. Where did you get this love of history? Well, I, I'd always been interested in politics. I was a political science major. I, I attended uh, school at the University of Southern California, which was kind of where history uh, and wine intersected, being in mm -hmm. California, particularly at that time when it was emerging as a, a wine producing powerhouse. So I, yeah. I simultaneously, uh, uh, develop both interests. Uh, probably history was more more time was spent consuming history than wine, but uh, but they're both interests I've had for most of my life. I mean, it, wine is uh, wine, wine is in this country has really had a complete renaissance transformation since the 1970s. Um, it, it is a uh, people who are into wine. I mean, they're connoisseurs of wine. They know what to, they know the different kinds of grapes. They know the different regions. Uh, how quickly did you become one of these, you know, real enthusiasts or was this, you know, passive and then it, kind of what was the trigger for you? Well, I mean, you, you identify I mean, a very interesting parallel that I discovered between wine enthusiasm and enthusiasm for, for politics or political candidate. We have our favorites. We want to know the backstory. We want to know the history. Uh, and, and it's not unlike and, and people save. Wine, wine enthusiasts have mementos and artifacts in the same right. You know, yeah, campaign buttons people, and, yeah. people save those artifacts. So there are a lot of parallels. Hmm. But as you, as you said, wine has, and it kind of tracks the American presidency and American politics. Wine has had this huge, huge uh, lift in, in recent decades. And it, it comes from, if, if you go back and we, we talk in the book about prohibition and the effects on prohibition, Prohibition killed wine in the United States for 13 years because it couldn't be produced. And then you met, you rolled into World War II shortly after that, and no wine was imported. So we were not a wine-consuming nation. We were basically a cocktail nation. Mm. But recent presidents, uh, starting with Truman and then uh, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and, and going forward, brought wine back. And yeah. it, it came back uh, both at the White House and came back in, in pop culture. There's one anecdote, Doug, you may have seen, I mentioned in the book, how pop culture was influencing our wine consumption habits. And it happened during the Kennedy administration. The James Bond films came out and he was a, yeah. a Bond enthusiast. And in one particular film, Dr. No, there's a scene, came out in 1962, where James Bond picks up a bottle of champagne off the table to use it to defend himself against the guards. And Dr. No calmly says, that's a Dom Perignon 55. It would be a pity to break it. Two months later, you look at the White House state dinner menu, and there on the menu is the Dom Perignon 1955, the same one go. that was mentioned in the movie. Yeah, that's 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 a great that's a great catch and connection. Uh, interesting to see. Okay, well, let's get back to the original culture then of American presidency, uh, created by our favorite president George Washington. Now, 
he didn't have the great uh, joy of living in the White House, which this book is about. So uh, what about Washington and his wine behavior? What do we know? Well, I, I describe Washington as a, a Madeira man. Uh, right. And the reason being that, uh, that at that time, remember the, the, the wines that were being consumed in the United States were shipped over in the holes of ships. And Madeira, a little island south of, of Portugal, uh, was producing a very hearty, fortified wine. And they discovered you could put it in the hull of a ship and it could go through the turbulence and go through the heat and would arrive in the United States maybe even better than it left. Mm. So Madeira became kind of the first wine of, of choice. But I found with, with Washington, even before he was president, I found a receipt when he was a general uh, just before the Battle of Monmouth in New Jersey, he had his war council together and he ordered casks of Madeira and Bordeaux wine to be delivered for them to consume as they were deliberating what they were going to do next. And that was uh, well before he was president. Yeah, you have a great uh, Washington quote in your book as well that he wrote to uh, the Marquis de Chateau about, uh, about the, the hilarity that comes from a glass of claret. Yes. Um, so he clearly enjoyed to, to have a glass of wine occasionally. Now, for the people at home, uh, Madeira, I have a bottle of Madeira right here on my desk, uh, which is uh, we when we sell at the Washington shops, at George Washington shops here at Mount Vernon. Um, Madeira is, uh, you said it's a fortified wine. What does that mean, Fred? How is that different from a, a red wine we might get somewhere? I'm going to pour uh, myself a glass. It's made... Uh, with grape varieties that are that are unique to Madeira, but it's fortified in the sense that the typical winemaking process involves harvesting the grapes, crushing the grapes, and then the sugar uh, would turn to alcohol, and then it's bottled. Well, when they fortify a wine, after there's already been the, the alcohol fermentation has taken place, they open it up and they add a little more alcohol, make it a little stronger, a little more durable. Mm. And um, and that's what made the alcohol level was higher, but that's what what enabled it to survive the long journey across the Atlantic. And it, and it doesn't turn. You can take you can open the bottle and and it, it'll last much longer before it turns to vinegar. For instance. months, you can open it. It can it can sit for months, unlike a regular bottle of wine that that could spoil quickly. Yeah. So so okay. So now Washington. One of the things in your book, obviously, when we think of wine culture in this country, a lot of people point to Jefferson. Uh, what can you say about Thomas Jefferson's relationship with wine and Washington? Well, he was, I would say Jefferson would be described as the, the founding father of wine in the United States. Uh, he was meticulous about it. Uh, he kept in-depth records of every wine that was served while he was president. In fact, I got a copy of his handwritten notes on that included in the book. Yeah, he, it's great. Uh, he designed the first White House wine cellar. Uh, and he, so he was instrumental, but, and, but his interesting role with George Washington, uh, he was Washington's wine advisor, essentially. Yeah. And because yeah. uh, he'd been the emissary, as you know, to Paris. And I found uh, this amazing letter. It was on the desk uh, in Bordeaux, France, of a winery that's been operating for more than 250 years. Yeah. And it called Chateau Ikim, one of the great wineries today in the world. And it was a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to the owner of Chateau Ikim at the time. And he said, uh, our new president, General Washington, is interested in wine. And I think he would like yours. So please send him 30 dozen bottles. And while you're at it, send me 10 dozen bottles as well. So yeah. those wines were shipped to Washington. Uh, yeah, as, I saw that. That letter's fantastic. It's for the president, for myself. For the president, yes, for myself. Yes, yes. Yeah, that, that what struck me too, Fred, was how many of the, um, I mean, the, the famous vineyards or regions certainly uh, that that Jefferson, you know, was buying wine from are still extant today, and that was really remarkable. He traveled throughout uh, France, Italy, Germany, exploring the wines, taking detailed notes, creating his own ranking system on yeah. which wines were uh, he would he would recommend over others. And uh, and that um, that he, that advice was something that he passed on to his, his successors uh, in in Paris and brought back. And not only did he advise Washington, he advised Madison and several presidents on their wines. Yeah. Well, well, well we know that uh, and we'll talk more about state dinners and how they've kind of evolved or the different kind of dinners. But we know that dinners were important politically, 
um, you know, as a student of politics uh, and as a connoisseur of wine, you know that at meals, wine is served and that's when wine and politics can mix very nicely. Um, uh, I think we have some uh, shots here. Matt, why don't you pull up the shot of the president's house in Philadelphia? So, so George Washington, as we know, Fred did not spend time in the White House, although he knew the White House well. He helped uh, pick the design of it. Um, but uh, the president's house here in Philly would have been the place where he and Jefferson would have been having some of these wines. Um, let's see another picture here. Here's a, a, a nice example of a card inviting someone to a, a nice uh, dinner with the president and Mrs. Washington. <clears throat> and this, Fred, doesn't seem too out of place today. No, these engraved invitations have continued to this day <laughs> when the president of the United States invites someone to the White House. It's it's really not that much different than this. Your lovely little keepsakes. What else we have here? Um, yeah, so in here are some of the, the table glass where rare rare survivors from an 18th century, which uh, might include a lot of drinking. Those, as, uh, as I mentioned to you, we were talking briefly at the beginning, I found the receipts that, that George Washington used when he ordered glassware, and uh, including decanters and those very glasses, at least it looks like those very glasses that you have in those collections, those are indeed rare artifacts. Yeah, well, yeah, there's a wonderful uh, uh, chapter in the book, folks, on the collections of the White House uh, around uh, different glassware, and, and we'll, uh, I think, talk a little about that as well. All right, so um, take this image down. Let's get back into the run of the show here. So uh, Jefferson's <clears throat> uh, famous for having lots of dinners where he would uh, have people sit around a round table, uh, emphasizing their equality. And he tried to keep things keep things light, but we've seen a real different, there's all kinds of different ways people have entertained in the White House in the 19th century. He he elevated uh, the entertaining in the sense that, he, as you said, he would have the round table so there could be a free conversation. And he created these special dumb waiters, I guess, that you could have multiple bottles of wine sitting on around the room so mm -hmm. the meal wouldn't be interrupted by having to reach out and ask one of the, the people on the wait staff to, to bring the, the, uh, the wine in. Uh, so he, he was uh, very big at the, the entertaining. And the other thing, though, that he, he deserves credit for was uh, building the first wine cellar in the White House. Yeah. Uh, when um, uh, when he, he moved in uh, after Adams, it was still a work in progress. The White House was not complete and there was no wine cellar, which is something Jefferson said, where's the wine cellar? I've got all this wine. The White House <laughs> should have a wine cellar. So he designed a wine cellar, which was under the front, the north portico of the White House at that time. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if you uh, have been out to Monticello, it very much resembles the cellar he designed for Monticello. Mm -hmm. And uh, interesting fact I, I learned in the, in the book was uh, when the, the British burned the White House during the War of 1812, uh, in August of 1814, they, as we, we hear the story, we've learned from our earliest uh, school days about how Dolly Madison saved the George Washington portrait. And it's back there today, thanks to her. But I wondered, what about all the wine? There was all this wine in the White House. What happened to that? And discovered and uh, researching this, that the British burned the White House and left. The American soldiers arrived and discovered there was this huge treasure of wine underneath the White House. So the American <laughs> soldiers drank it. <laughs> That's what happened to the wine. <clears throat> yeah, they had to drown their tears, I'm afraid, in that case. Yeah, that's uh, that's a sad story for a lot of reasons, Fred. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it, it's, so the wine cellar uh, is um, is something Jefferson, Jefferson designs originally. It keeps getting, um, if, you know, fixed over the years. It, it goes underground at some point, right? Yeah, it actually made a, an odd evolution and, and, and an unfortunate one in the end. It was... It was after the White House burned, it was it was rebuilt, a second wine cellar. And then when the Truman renovation of the White House was done from mm -hmm. 1948 to 52, as you know, the entire facility was gutted. Yeah, there was a very modest wine cellar left. And that's evolved to today. And this was one of the big disappointments I discovered firsthand. There really is no White House wine cellar. I yeah. had visions yeah. of this room with the arches and the mold and the yes, dusty that was shocking. That is shocking. There's not, yeah. and, and by the way, the Queen of, of England in her cellar has 38,000 bottles of wine. The <laughs> Elise Palace has, in France has 18,000 bottles. Mm. The White House today, there is no wine cellar. There's a little closet, a 
pantry basically that has mm-hmm. about 300 bottles of wine. And it's, uh, it's purchased now on an event by event basis yeah. rather than acquired, had been done in the past, it was acquired and then it transferred to future presidents. Uh, that that shocked me, Fred, when I read that. I also imagined some incredible seller with this stuff in there that was left from Jackson or, you know, That's God the, knows what, you know, that you could crawl around and find some great, because there was a, was it Polk? Uh, there's a story of one of the 19th century guys who, who gave a very bad dinner and then he felt bad. So he's like, come on down, let's go to the cellar. And they looked through and drank a bunch of Tyler, wine. yes. Tyler, was that t- oh Tyler John Tyler, Tyler. Our, our, our tenth president was yeah. having a dinner and the food was awful and it was a group he was trying to impress and yeah. being a smart politician he said let's forget the food he, he called the butler and said give me the key to the wine cellar they went down to the wine cellar and they opened bottles and drank and drank and drank until they couldn't drink anymore <laughs> left as happy guests I think yeah well that so that was what i was hoping there was some kind of old musty wine cellar somewhere in the white house but yeah you, you broke that illusion there's got to be some at the Greenbrier or something there's got to be some <laughs> secret stock of wine out there anyway but that that was fascinating because yeah you, you the pictures you have of the of the british and, and french equivalents uh, are pretty remarkable but one of the things about early america and also well into the 19th century uh, is how much they they drank. I mean, water was not a thing that you would drink, and so all sorts of you know distilled and and alcoholic beverages were part of the daily diet. Ciders and punches and all these sorts of things. And um, one of the things you talked about is is just the quantity and diversity of of types of wines that would be drunk at these White House events. Oh, well, there were there were presidents that would serve eight different wines at the course yeah. of a dinner, uh, yeah. and uh, I found some of the wine bills. There were there were dinners where thirty thousand dollars in today's money, thirty thousand dollars was spent on the champagne. Mm. So they were drinking a lot, and they were they were spending a lot. And at that time, these were mostly uh, thanks to Thomas Jefferson. These were mostly Euro- European, in fact, exclusively European wines, mostly French. Uh, mm-hmm. but uh, only the wines of Europe. And thanks to yeah. Jefferson, they found ways to get them to the United States more efficiently with less breakage, less heat exposure. And that began you know, the American infatuation with European wines. Uh, and wines have always been sort of political in a sense, or drinking at least is political. First, you get the kind of temperance movements happening. And and so some of the presidents are involved with that politics and they don't want to be seen as a a drinker in the White House or supporting that, but then they, they feel pressured to do it because you got you, the diplomats coming through and you can't not have serve wine at a dinner. Uh, talk a little yeah. about that, about the different politics of wine consumption. Sure. Well, you know, we had obviously prohibition from 1920 to 1933, <laughs> yeah. but well before that was, as you've described, the temperance mu- movement. And that was just an outright effort to ban alcohol consumption. And it became very political. Candidates would take the temperance pledge that they would not drink alcohol or serve alcohol. And it kind of came to a head, a diplomatic head uh, during the uh, administration of uh, Rutherford B. Hayes, our 19th president. Uh, The son of the Russian czar, who at that time was very important to us, was coming to the United States for a state visit. And the diplomat said, you must serve wine. It would be an affront. It would be an embarrassment. You must serve wine. His wife, Lucy Hayes was a leader in the, uh, the temperance movement. Mm. And she finally agreed, caved in, and allowed wine to be served at that dinner in 1877. And it's the only time it was served in the entire uh, Hayes administration. In fact, as you mentioned earlier, this very elaborate glassware had been purchased by the predecessors, yeah. and she would serve fruit juice in it. And uh, as a result, she was given the nickname of Lemonade Lucy because of the fruit juice in the wine glasses yeah uh, that's um i wouldn't enjoy those kind of state dinners <laughs> i'm afraid but uh i do think uh, that i was also shocked because as a historian i'm always embarrassed to admit i don't know anything about american history but in the, i don't know much at all about chester arthur and now i have a great anecdote from your book which is that he he was quite the bon vivant i mean he He's he's one of the guys I think that served eight different wines at dinners and uh, really blew it up. Or am I am I missing? Oh no no, he was very elaborate, and as you know, he did the uh, the the Tiffany remodeling. Yes, uh, and would serve 
<laughs> long 14, I think one of them was a 14 course dinner uh, with wines accompanying yeah. each course. Yeah. Uh, it was a, a very, uh, uh, it was a time when alcohol was really flowing in the White House. Yeah. Okay, so, well, let's, uh, let's transport ourselves a little more into the modern era. Um, I mean, the 19th century is fascinating because there's so much diversity uh, and, and, and much less um, what we think of as, I mean, maybe, maybe it's just that we don't have the records. Maybe we do, Fred. I mean, it, you know, it's not always clear what, kind, what specific wines they're serving. We know they're serving a red or they're serving a champagne or something like that, but it's not clear always you know who the winemaker is i think um that, well, that, that kind of evolved uh going back actually to uh, to, to teddy roosevelt uh, his okay. wife edith for reasons i don't know uh directed that the menu should not specify the maker of the wine it should hmm. only say the variety so it would say bordeaux wine uh. or spanish wine it wouldn't say who made it and hmm. um it's unclear. Some people think maybe that she wanted to serve the cheapest ones, so no one really know that she was serving the cheap stuff. Uh, but uh, that that was kind of uh, the the beginning of uh, the the service of, of American wines. Frankly, uh, it it moved uh, after it was it had been French up until uh, the, well the time of the, of um, prohibition, and then American wines began to emerge. And and, and Eleanor Roosevelt, of course, with with prohibition ending during FDR's time, uh, directed that wines at the White House should be limited and domestic. Hmm. And that was a little bit of a, a problem because at that time, the American wine industry was really nowhere near where it is today. And I, hmm. I found the diary of Harold uh, Ickes, who had been Secretary of the Interior uh, during the uh, FDR administration. And he was talking yeah. about a dinner at the White House. And he said, under her rule of domestic wines only, most of the wines were terrible and the champagne was undrinkable. <laughs> so, uh, and that's kind of where American wines were at that time. But yeah. it, as, as time went on, they began becoming much, much better and, and world, world class. So how, how did the California grower survive the, uh, the, the prohibition? I mean, some of them are from, I think, what, the 1880s, 1870s, maybe even earlier, but... Um, <laughs> They somehow pressed on through there. Would they make they, grape juice? Or there were grape? about uh, about less than two dozen that survived. I think around wow. 18 survived. And they were Amazing. making wine for religious purposes. Amazing. And all I can think of, there must have been a lot of communion taking place at that time. Because for them to stay in business for this limited religious purpose, <laughs> uh, they, they must have had a lot of good, good customers. But it was interesting. Yeah. an interesting thing about Prohibition uh, that affected one president, uh, Woodrow Wilson was, of course, he he signed the Volstead Act that implemented mm -hmm. the, the 18th Amendment. Reluctantly, he vetoed the Volstead Act, and then Congress overrode his veto. Yeah, that was from, I, another factoid. I did not know that Wilson had vetoed that, and he was overridden. He was overridden. Uh, and he yeah. had himself a, a significant wine cellar in the White House. Because the Volstead he, Act, to remind people, is crucial because it, it would say how Congress was going to enforce prohibition. And so exactly. you could you could have regulate, you could add near beer, you could add all kinds of different things in there. It didn't have to be as strict as it was. Yeah. No, it uh, and it, it specified you could not uh, manufacture, sell, dis, uh, distribute or transfer alcohol, but you could mm. own it. So. Woodrow Wilson had this big wine cellar, and at the end of his administration, he wanted to take his wine cellar out of the White House over to that house on F S Street that he moved to. Okay. And he had to get special regulatory approval because it was transporting alcohol, which was illegal under the Volstead Act. But he, he was able to do it, and, uh, and parts of that cellar are still there. Now, that cellar, so did Wilson, did Wilson, I mean, was that his property or that, had that been acquired for years and he just gets to take it all because he's the last man out? Before you the, know, it's unclear. He, he did bring some, you know, he'd been, he'd been president of Princeton and he right. had, uh, in that role, he'd been known to serve alcohol and be mm -hmm. a, uh, quite a toastmaster. So, yeah. um, so some <laughs> of this is how much of it was, I don't, I don't know how, how clearly they took inventories of the wine cellar back at that time. It felt to me, reading your book, it felt like Wilson like clears out the White House wine cellar. But, right. but anyway, yeah. So, well, so, and, and then the, yeah. as you mentioned, going on, it became Roosevelt. The wine was served, but it wasn't very good. And then 
Uh, by the time Eisenhower came around, California wines began to be served, but they were more of a novelty. They were yeah. something you'd serve at an insignificant event. And right. um, that kind of that progressed to Kennedy. And of course, with Kennedy, everything Mrs. Kennedy was so focused on elegant French cuisine and attire and, and French wine. And yeah. uh, the, some of the very best wines in the world were served in, during the Kennedy administration at the Kennedy White House. So yeah, that so was Cam pretty much all French. So what does what does Camelot mean, uh, Fred? For uh, you know, when we think about the Kennedy White House, why was it why was it seen as such a change from you know the Eisenhower years? And you know, I mean, why was it so so different in the in the way that people thought about it? And they thought about it in terms of you know entertaining and in terms of its hospitality. And what about I, I that? think it was. I mean, I think there were a lot of dimensions to it. One of them was that this is America's house. This would be the, where we showcase the very nicest things in America and mm -hmm. bringing the art and bringing back the furniture and having it a place that that we would want any world leader to see. I think that was part of it. I think uh, an elegant America had had come out of the, a, a war and it was uh, it, we were kind of coming out of our own as a world power and wanted to be a place that could be elegant. She, of course, her taste was was so um, such magnificent taste in everything she did. But she definitely had the, the French bias. So there, it mm -hmm. moved to all French wine. Then Lyndon Johnson okay. comes around and it moves back to California wine. And in fact, okay. the California Wine Institute would bring, bring big trucks over to the White House and they would unload California mm -hmm. wine and LBJ would serve it to his guests. Yeah, it's the trade associations. They know how to get it done That's in DC exactly. for sure. I've been to some of their junkets. That's uh, quite, a, quite a quite a thing. So let, before we go on, let's. Uh, I got some images here, as, as you know. I mean, Jackie Kennedy throws an incredible steak dinner here at Mount Vernon, uh, which some people say was the first held outside of the White House. Although, I'd, actually, I would pose that question to you, Fred. I, that can't be correct. But what do you think? Is it the first steak well, dinner? Well, you know, there were some. I you could. I, I can't say for sure, but for example, during the Truman administration, when the White House was not available, there were state events held at Blair House and right. other locations. Uh, but that was clearly a, a very special evening. And yeah. uh, I know you, I, I came across the menu, and I know you have it in your collection, and you can see that uh, the Kennedys made sure that the, their guest, the Prime Minister of Pakistan, uh, was served the, the finest wines that were available. Yeah, so remarkable. That's the, the Prime Minister of Pakistan's daughter there next to Jack Kennedy, and they're looking, obviously, across the river to Maryland in front of the mansion. Uh, this is July of 1961. Let's see... Uh, Another shot here. This is him arriving at Mount Vernon off the Sequoia, which is the presidential yacht. Uh, he arrived that way, and a lot of the other guests arrived in a different fashion. Um, what what else? What's next here? Oh, this it was a beautiful tent out on the on the lawn at Mount Vernon, and this was the really the first time the Mount Vernon Ladies Association had allowed any kind of tented event out in front of George Washington's mansion. It was really a big deal for the institution as well. And and Jackie Kennedy, I mean, you'll remember she did that famous tour of the White House, um, you know, when she toured the White House and talked about the furnishings and talked about the house and its history and all that. I think uh, she would have wanted to be one of the ladies of Mount Vernon, uh, Fred. I think that would have been something that appealed to her because this her table settings were helped put together by, by Henry DuPont for this event. So this was going to be the elegance of elegance uh, here. Uh, go show a few more here, and then we'll get back to the book. Uh, yeah, there's the, the seating chart I love. <laughs> you know, as, as you do a lot with state dinners in this book and studied state dinners and talk a little bit about them. But I love the seating chart here. I mean, obviously, we can't read all the details, but you can see Mrs. Kennedy is in bigger, you know, and and, uh, and the president at a different table. Uh, what what next? Uh, oh, here here's the. Uh, so tell me about these wines. Uh, well, these were two we of, the, of the best wines you could have possibly found at that time. The mm. uh, the first, uh, the, the Champagne, Moet Chandon, Imperial Brut, 1955, uh, yeah. was truly exceptional. And the, the Chateau Aubryon, 1958, first wine served. That is when the French ranked their wines, of every wine in all of Bordeaux, and they ranked their top five. And one of the top five is the Chateau Aubryon. So... Uh, she mm -hmm. knew her wines, and she knew that this would be well received to this special guest. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting. So, this is—is is this typical to have a white and then a champagne, and then just uh, like look, looks like then, some kind of dessert wines or liqueurs afterward? 
So as you know, so much of the uh, the state dinner is is geared around the preferences of the guest, and I, yeah. I'm wondering whether typically she would serve a white wine and then a red wine and then a champagne. And I'm wondering mm-hmm. maybe his food or, or wine preferences were yeah. were more for these white wines. Interesting. All right, so uh, let's see another slide here. One of the things about steak dinners is the pomp and circumstance that they're accompanied by. In many cases, here at Mount Vernon, there was some uh, colonial fireworks going on there, it looks like. And I think that's probably it, uh, Matt. I think that's all we have from the Kennedys there. Um, so so the Kennedy, in your book, you really start to see, you know, the the, um, the use of wine and its system, systematic use the emphasis on American wines really starts. It's a post-war phenomenon for a lot of reasons. Um, but uh, you, 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 you really make the Reagan administration, I think, as a real uh, pivot point uh, where wine really becomes a little more systematic. Well, well for, for a couple of reasons, I think. One, um, Reagan was very knowledgeable about wines. He would, uh, we talked about Thomas Jefferson, who by far was the most knowledgeable, but I would say Two other presidents that had quite an extensive knowledge of wines were Richard Nixon, who had surprised me. He'd grown up as a, as a Quaker with a very simple background, but he became very knowledgeable on wines, particularly the wines of France and Germany. And then Reagan, who had an interest in wines. And of course, he was governor of California at the time that the California wine industry was coming of age. Yeah. And he played a big part in that. So when he came to the White House, he was uh, determined to make sure that when so much of state dinners is showcasing the best of America. He wanted to make sure that California wines were showcased and uh, and did a lot to advance California wines during his administration. And did they have a policy or just a preference that all the wines would be American at state state dinners? There was a preference. In fact, Doug, there was an, a, a funny circumstance that happened. Uh, Reagan's strong preference was to serve California wines. Uh, and in the wine cellar, there there were wines because the cellar was a little more expansive at that time. There were wines that had been purchased by his predecessors from France, including wines that Richard Nixon, who knew French wines, had purchased. Mm. Rare, valuable wines that had been aging for a future president to serve. But at the time, it was felt we should be showcasing American wines, not French wines. So they were served exclusively American wines, except for one event. There was an event where press from across the country had been brought into the White House. It was it was kind of like today where the presidents were always trying to figure out how most effectively to get their message out. And President Reagan's view was if I could bring in these local TV anchors and these editors from all across the country and I can I can sidestep the national press, I can get my message out. So he brought them in for a day of briefings. Mm. All the cabinet spoke to them, people dealing with the issues of the day, including the president himself. And then they had lunch. And somehow during lunch, the people selecting the wine took this 1970 Burgundy from France and they mm. served it to all these journalists who were there. Wow. Well, the number one story that came out of that whole day of briefings and time with the presidents was Reagan serves French wine at the White House. And uh, <laughs> it was it was not served again during his administration. Oh, wow. So that was like, oh, we got all this wine we got to get rid of. Let's serve it to the journalists. Nice. Right, right. <laughs> Turns out, oh my goodness, that's that's a funny story. Now, you obviously worked in the in the Reagan administration, the White House. Uh, what was Ronald Reagan like? Hey, he was he was terrific. He was uh, a, a very genuine person. He was somebody who uh, I think whether you were the the Queen of England or the the the, the usher or the custodian, you, he treated you with equal respect and was one of these rare people that uh, it's exactly the same off camera as they are on camera and uh, mm-hmm. no no facade and nancy was very much involved in the wines i would imagine as well and the and the and the entertaining i know she picked the china she she yes she spent a lot of time planning the state visits as most first ladies have done uh throughout our history and particularly recent first ladies and uh as you know having been to, to the white house for state dinner uh it's a One. it's a three-hour event <laughs> <laughs> but there is weeks and months of planning that go into that. Every aspect from the entertainment yeah. to which China to use, to what food should be served, which wines should be served, yeah. and, and who should be invited to make sure that it's a very diverse, interesting group. So she did spend a lot of time on that. But the final decisions on wines were made uh, by President Reagan because of his interest in wines. And he'd maintained um, 
his relationships with the California wine industry. And he knew who to call. And he had one particular person he would reach out to to get recommendations on which wines would be the, be the best for him to mm -hmm. serve to his guests. Yeah, you write about that gentleman uh, who helped him help help the, the White House there with their wines. And that became finally a little more formalized in the Clinton administration with a, an official wine sommelier or usher, I guess. So, uh, talk about that. Why, why finally did we get an official <laughs> wine expert in the White well, House? I, I'd say for most of our history, presidents relied on their own judgments or Amazing. the judgments of friends like Thomas Jefferson or someone who yeah. might have a suggestion. <laughs> Well, he's a good and, one to ask. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Fred, can I call you next time I'm having a dinner party? I say, what should I serve with the lamb? I mean, you know, <laughs> anytime. <laughs> big time. <laughs> uh, well, so, well, well, I do have, I do have a little show and tell here. So I have a piece of the uh, Reagan China ah, uh, right, right here. Did would you take that served. with you when you were at the state dinner? <laughs> no, I just, it put it, you know, just slipped it, slipped it right <laughs> in the, the pocket here. Now, Mount Vernon had a very generous gift from Lennox of a lot of these uh, extra uh, presidential chinas, and so we happen to have some uh, some here. That's the Reagan plate, the beautiful red that she had there. Um, my, yeah, my state dinner uh, was the uh, the Trump Macron visit, and I think one of your books is interesting. The, the French obviously are the kings of wine making in the world, and so what do we serve when we have French premiers and presidents? Uh, at a state dinner, what you know? Are you afraid? You don't want to offend them. You want to support your guests, and at the same time, you want to show off. But then you don't want them to look down their nose at some American wine. So, how, well, that, how, how about that? That actually came up uh, for the first time at a dinner President Reagan had for Prime Minister Chirac of France, hmm. yeah. who had been a longtime friend of his, and they both enjoyed wine. So Chirac came to a state dinner in 1987, and here you have France, the global powerhouse of wine. And you have America that's also on the scene that's making some great wines as well. And Reagan made a very diplomatic decision. He served a wine called Opus One. And Opus mm -hmm. One is a joint venture between Philippe de Rothschild of France, one of the great winemakers of France, and Robert Mondavi, one of the great mm -hmm. winemakers of the United States. So it was a perfect diplomatic solution. And mm -hmm. that, that uh, practice is carried forward into the dinner that you attended, uh, mm -hmm. the Mrs. Trump selected some great American wines, all of which were made by either winemakers with French ancestry or by companies that also produce wine in France. So it was a, mm. a good, a very, a very good chance again to show the diplomacy of wine. That's, that's really, that's really fascinating. Why does it matter? Why does this matter, Fred? I mean, why does that, that, uh, why do we have to be so meticulous about a state dinner like that. Why? Why does it have to be the right wine, and that, why does it have to tell a story? How does that impact the guests, well, the 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 moment, the the history? Well, I think the two things. One is the state dinners, as I mentioned earlier, a chance to really showcase the best of America, the best food, the best entertaining at the White House, uh, and the, the best wines. And at the same time, though, it's a way to show. Uh, a commonality or a shared interest with our guests. And one was particularly clear to me, I learned in the book, uh, was President Bush 43. And I discovered, although he was not a, a wine drinker, of course, he, the great efforts were made by Mrs. Bush and others to ensure that the fantastic wines were served. But what I found was uh, they, that the Bushes were in 2003, were on a state visit to, the, to England to dinner at Buckingham Palace. Yeah. And as you know, part of that is there's a reciprocal dinner the next day, typically at the ambassador's residence. So I looked to see what wines the Bushes served to the Queen when she came to this reciprocal dinner at the ambassador's residence, Winfield House. Yeah. And it was two wines, uh, both. Uh, one was a, a Newton Chardonnay made in California, and the other was a Peter Michael Cabernet Sauvignon, also made in California. But what I learned was Newton was a British winemaker who'd come to the United States and started making wine. Hmm. And Peter Michael Cabernet was made by Sir Peter Michael, who the Queen had knighted. So <laughs> that was served in 2003. Fast forward to 2005, Prince Charles, Prince of Wales and Camilla come for a dinner at the Bush White House. I looked to see what wines they served. The same wine, Peter Michael Chardonnay, excuse me, Peter Michael Cabernet and uh, Newton yeah. Chardonnay. Fast forward final time, 2007, the queen herself comes to the White House. The same two wines were served. 
So I figured somebody <laughs> sent the word back, maybe at the first dinner, that the queen was pleased with their wow. selections because they were repeated <laughs> on every occasion. That's amazing. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's a great that's a great story for sure. All right, so uh, let's um, let's see if there's any questions from the folks out there as well as we continue to talk, and they'll pop up here on the screen. But Fred, why don't you, in the interim, while we're searching out some of those, you have your own uh, wine, you have your own uh, vineyard, or your own um, what do we call it? Uh, bottles well, it's of wine. A, I, I got involved in a, a joint venture. I, I just was curious and just wanted to see what it was like to be in winemaking, but I certainly yeah. didn't want to go buy a bunch It sounds of really sexy. I mean, a lot of people are like, oh, wouldn't it be great to have a wine? You make wine, you have a vineyard. How uh, does well, that it work? Was, you yeah. know, it is work. People who, uh, if you make <laughs> wine, you are at the mercy of nature. If it is mm -hmm. a, a hot summer, a cold summer, if there's a fire, if there's hail, if there's uh, too much moisture, I mean, there are a lot of things that can happen. But I, the venture I was in, I, I found a great winemaker who shared the same last name. So we knew what we were going to do. So we knew the name and did a, a three-year venture where we produced wine out in Napa Valley and didn't make so much of it that if the economy turned, we couldn't just have a few really big parties and consume all of it. But it was a great, a great learning experience. Uh, but one thing, Doug, you asked me, and I guess I kind of got off track, you asked about the professional selection of wine at the White House. And that's something that President Clinton did. He hired yeah. uh, a guy named Daniel Shanks, who was a wine professional and yeah. uh, who, who was meticulous in selecting serving and making sure that the wine experience of the White House was the best it could be. And I was very fortunate that he uh, included a chapter for me in this book talking about how that worked. Yeah, it's a great little oral history. You had him write out for you here. It's fantastic. There's a tremendous amount of other things in here. You've got you've got a list and we'll talk about I want to talk about my my Trump dinner here, but you've got a list of every invitation to a state dinner, I think going back to Eisenhower. That's the, uh, uh, which is really cool. I mean, one, one thing, it's the first time we, it's ever been put together is we, we got every wine that's been served at any official function in the White House since 1953. Oh, that's what you have. Yeah, you have every and, wine listed. Yeah. And it's a great, it's a great uh, tool for, for wine aficionados or people who just want to have fun. You can go back yeah. and you can look up a particular president. You can see the wine they served. You can go to the store and buy that current vintage today, and you can hmm. you can recreate a state dinner at the White House. <laughs> well, that's a lot of fun. Well, let's recreate a little bit of the state dinner that we had here at Mount Vernon at my time. Matt, show us some. So, uh, President Trump and Macron. This is in uh, 2018, in April of 2018, uh, and it was the first state visit, official state visit of the Trump, which was going to include a state dinner of the Trump presidency, which seems fairly late in the game, I guess. Um, they didn't, they haven't had a lot of state dinners. They, of they, they, they've done, you know, different types of entertaining, but in terms of formal yeah. state dinners, they've only had two. And in fact, is that, is the, that right? the cover of the book is the other state dinner, which was also spectacular. And that yeah, was a Rose dinner Garden. for the prime minister of Australia. And yeah. I adopted the cover. It's, it's, it's based on that. I, I wanted to cover, I wanted you to feel, I want you to feel like you were sitting in the seat of the president of the United States. <laughs> yeah. So we, we added yeah. a few things. We added, for example, that decanter, that decanter in front of him. the president usually doesn't have a decanter sitting in front of him today, but that's James Madison's decanter. It's been oh in the White goodness. House collection ever since. Well, so here's the Trump uh, visit to, uh, to Mount Vernon. Of course, we, you spoke of it very eloquently uh, about the, the power of these dinners. It's about telling stories, connecting with these these nations that we have shared values with. Here, of course, at Mount Vernon, we have the key to the Bastille that was given by Lafayette to George Washington. I had toured Trump and Macron and, and Mrs. Macron, which I, one thing I learned, Fred, is you don't call the First Lady of France the First Lady of France. You call her Mrs. Macron in this case. And, uh, you know, so that's that was uh, uh, another uh, anecdote I learned. But Trump, when he, I mean, Macron, when he saw the key to the Bastille, he was just so excited about it. And, uh, you know, and he started talking very quickly in French and uh, then he had to go back to English. And it was really, it really is a powerful, long alliance with the French that we've had, um, you know, that, that is deep in our roots as a nation. And, and of course, food is such a powerful uh, way to connect with each other as well. So it was a wonderful night. But one of the things, Fred, I wanted to show you is this photograph. Um, 
hardly approved for release because we went, didn't want to show any photos of people dining inside the mansion. This had not been done at Mount Vernon really in any formal way um, uh, since the 1920s when there was a luncheon for a Russian princess or, or a Polish princess or some uh, Eastern European princess of some kind. <laughs> But and so this is just the four of them, and the, the ladies had stepped out here to, to freshen up before dinner. And so they just sat down. Uh, and this is what's called the new room at Mount Vernon. It's George Washington's really state room. It's his statement room where he, you know, he he did he decorated this and designed it after the American Revolution to speak to American ideas and values. And I think we have another shot here. And I so so I was trying hard to get my hands on this menu. And so I could get that wine for you, for your for your concordant, uh, your your document here. So, but you can't really read this, but it basically is a stag's leap Chardonnay. And I think it's only one wine is on here on this menu a card. Stag's leap Chardonnay. I think it's a 2015 or 16. We can find out. But but that's a stag's leap is a famous. Um, it's a famous uh, Chardonnay in the in the story of American wines. It's it's famous in in several respects. One, uh, it's been served very frequently at the White House. It's been a favorite uh, of President Reagan's for one, but other presidents as well. Mm -hmm. And also, you may remember Stag's Leap. There was the the, the story uh, uh, that, uh, that took place in 1976 called the Judgment of Paris, where a Stephen Spurrier, who was kind enough to uh, personally share his information with me for the book, had a blind tasting where he took American wines to some of the leaders of the French, uh, French wine industry oh. and decided at the last minute actually to make it a blind tasting and not tell people what they were drinking. And then he asked them to rank the wines. And of course, that's when America really got a, a global seal of approval that the mm -hmm. French themselves in a blind tasting ranked American wines higher than they ranked their own French wines. And Stag's Leap was one of those. Yeah, it was the big, bold, uh, the cab, uh, at the cabs and the and the Chardonnays, I think that we're right. competing with white Burgundies and uh, right. I mean that right. That's, you tell me, but that's a, such a great story. I think there's a movie about it. There is. Uh, as yeah, well. yeah. I don't know how accurate it's, it is, but you've got the man himself in here. It's just really remarkable. Uh, the other thing about um, now California vines uh, are from a European stock originally, and they've also helped repopulate uh, European vines yes when Cal you're exactly right when california wine uh, wineries began they imported the wine stock from france mm -hmm. and uh used that they grafted it to the roots and they grew and that began that was the beginning of the california wine industry and then in, in the, the late uh, 19th century this this very small insect called phylloxera hit the the french wine industry in a huge way and it, it, mm -hmm. it ate the roots of the vines, killed the vines. And the French wine industry was essentially wiped out. And so they mm. went back to America and they got the, the roots from the American vines that they had first brought to America, brought wow. them back to France and replanted the French, French vineyards and they're making wine today off of those vines. That's, that's really quite extraordinary. That is something I did not know. And it's in your, in your, so the book is filled with great, great things in here. And I, my team is, telling me we're having trouble getting the uh, questions to come through. Um, so, so uh, oh, here we got one. How does a winery make themselves known to the White House? Oh, this is really a good question, actually, because you'd think that every vintner in the country would want to send their wines to somebody in the know and say, hey, get me at a steak dinner. Well, it, that is a very like good when question. When Ryan, the Ryan bottles, so you're standing outside there like handing out Ryan bottles. <laughs> and everybody's walking in the White House, right? No, it's, it's a great question because uh, you're right. Every winemaker in the country or in the world would like to have their wines showcased at the White House. Talk about a, a, a high a quality judgment call. Uh, but the, the process doesn't really work that way. Two things. One is the White House today doesn't look to serve the most expensive wine or the highest rated wine even. Hmm. They're not trying to, to prove they're trying to find wines that are interesting right. and that complement the evening. So it's the process is not winemakers make their submissions and the White House selects. The White House, through its wine advisors, select various wines to try, uh, unbeknownst to the winemaker. They'll purchase it at a regular store, 
they'll bring it in, they'll see how it pairs with the food, and, and eventually they have a tasting dinner with the, the first lady and sometimes the president where they'll make the ultimate call to choose the wine. Mm. And then when a wine is served, the White House is, is mindful of, uh, of avoiding adverse publicity. So if, uh, or too much promotion based on that. So if a wine is served, the, the, the winery is encouraged not to be extremely aggressive in social media or other places and pushing it, or they probably wanted their wine served again. Well, we'll we'll see how that lasts. I mean, if Trump only had two official steak dinners, I mean, my goodness, it's a different era in, in terms of media, as you just pointed out with social media. So it'll be interesting to see if they can control themselves. <laughs> but, right. uh, what a great opportunity that would be. It's um, uh, I've got another question here. Let's see uh, who we got. Adam Harris. Is there any historical evidence that explains Washington's preference for sweet rinds? Or other drinks. I don't know if he had a preference for sweet wines, but what do you think? Uh, well, I we know that you know, they, they drank a lot of sweet wines in the, in the earlier period. They did. Wines of those days, even the best ones, are ones that we probably today wouldn't rank particularly high. They just, winemaking has evolved uh, and mm -hmm. just become so much better that they're able to make wines that are. Uh, that last longer and that have a more balance to them. But Madeira, I think what, the point that, that I think he's, uh, Adam Harris is mentioning this question is Madeira is, uh, it comes in different forms. There's a sweet form of Madeira, very sweet wine. And then there are some that are, some that are more dry. Mm -hmm. And I think the full range of Madeiras were probably enjoyed by President Washington and others at his time. So that would have been, and, and the reason probably was availability. A lot of other wines couldn't make it, but those Madeiras could. Yeah, the Madeiras are, it, it's an interesting story because they had a, the Madeira Islands uh, in Port, Portugal had an alliance with the British, which allowed them to circumnavigate the Navigation Act. So they could trade Madeira to the colonies and it was tax-free essentially, right. as opposed to Canary, you know, you know, the Spanish islands wines. And those, you know, actually were more, uh, drunk in London, uh, like Spanish island wines, and Madeira was more of a col colonies right. uh, wine, and it has a lot to do with availability. As you say, it's like what, what, what can I have access to? Well, here's this Madeira, and it's cheap. So, but yeah, uh, but but it has fallen out of favor. I mean, people don't really drink Madeira today, and you know, it's kind of rare that you would see it, it served. It, it, it it's very rare. But one thing that was interesting, I learned that. Um, all the way from Washington, all the way to President Obama at his inaugural lunch, perhaps in tribute to George Washington or Doug, maybe you sent him a bottle of that, but somebody, <laughs> I need to. there was Madeira served at his inaugural lunch at the Capitol. So I love it. Our, no, well, our that's 44th great. fourth president had it. Well, on that, on that note, before we take one of our final questions here, I would like to raise a, a glass in honor of George Washington. It is the day that he died, uh, December 14th. So, uh, and and I hope you have a, a glass of something good there. I have a glass of this Madeira. You can see the beautiful color of it. And you've got a beautiful red. What is that? I have a, it's a California Cabernet Sauvignon. Hmm, beautiful. All right. Well, here's to yes. the, the first and always, George Washington. Here, here, here. Yeah, you mentioned in the book about the tradition of toasting uh, and... and um, some of these events in the, in the early republic, they would toast all night long or toast 13 times. Toasting, I, I learned a, a lot that surprised me about toasting. And um, <laughs> in fact, it goes all the way back to, to Roman days. And in fact, the, 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 the word toast emanated from that. There would be these, these huge dinners where a large vessel of wine would be passed around and one person would take a drink. They would hand it to the person next to them and wish them good health. Uh, I and see. what happened though that the, the the wine was not very good in fact it was pretty awful so they would put a piece of burnt bread toast in the wine to absorb the impurities and that's where the word toast came from uh, the other one even more gross than that is i learned <laughs> in the scottish highlands uh, around the 10th century they after a successful battle, the, the the warriors would come back and they would drink from the skulls of the enemy they had killed. Huh. And if Long. you ever hear the expression "skull" when someone's having, oh yeah, a drink, sure, skull. Yeah, that's like that, a that's like Viking stuff, right? right. Yeah, that's skull. The Norwegians and things. Yeah, <laughs> we were more 
we're more civilized in the United States. We just went for, uh, in, yeah. in the early days, 13 different toasts in recognition of the 13 colonies. Yeah. But they were in wine glasses. Yeah, I read a description of Washington visiting in, uh, in Newport when he was president in 1790. And they not only had the 13 toasts, but they, they had toasts and then they, they had 13 cannon shots. So they'd yes. fire up a cannon after each toast as well. So that's a fun yeah. way to do it. All right, let's get that uh, final question here. I think there's one more. Um, Cynthia Miller, how has the breadth and depth of conversations evolved over time since George Washington's era with wine drinking in general and with types of wine? Well, it, it made the kind of the, the type of wine made the evolution from Madeira to, to French, uh, primarily, although Italian wines and others were served, German wines were served in the White House to today, yeah. as we've been talking about, it's become um, pure California. And, and, and that's kind of uh, tracked the, the emergence of the California wine industry. The California wine industry is on the global stage today, equivalent to France or Italy or any other. So that's mm -hmm. kind of um, that's, that's led to that. How, how are the other states coming along? I mean, obviously, I'm, I, Pinot Noirs in Oregon and Washington are well known now internationally. Virginia seems to be on the make. The Obamas yes. had a Virginia vineyard featured in one of their state dinners. No, you're, you're absolutely right. And I've been saying California, and I should probably in recent administrations be saying more American wine, because although the, the majority has been California, every state in America now makes wine. And yeah. in Amazing. different states. Yeah, you said that you wrote that uh, Alaska apparently right? has a wine. Gerald Ford, when he was president, served the first Michigan wine in the White House. But uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, a Virginia wine not far from Mount Vernon was served by the Obamas. And, and Mrs. Obama was, by the way, and is a great uh, appreciator of wine. In fact, she and her lady friends would have uh, wine tastings from time to time. She went out to Virginia. She went to a, a winery called RDV, uh, which is just out of Washington, Northern Virginia, and loved the wine so much that she served at a state dinner at the White House. Amazing. Yeah, that's uh, that, it's exciting to see. I mean, I, I grew up in Williamsburg. There's a Williamsburg winery there and uh, went to the University of Virginia. Barbersville has got some sure. great wines going. Um, what kind of wine do you make, Fred? The, the wine that I've been involved in making is, is Pinot Noir, three, three varieties, Pinot Noir, Syrah, mm. uh, and uh, uh, Chardonnay. Now, Syrah and, uh, is the one, I, I would associate that with like Australia? Uh, is it, it is, exactly right, Doug. Well, they actually, in, in Australia, they call it Shiraz, but it's okay. the same grape. Uh, okay. And it's a, it's a popular wine. It's a wine that lasts a long time and uh, a wine that's been served at the White not my wine, but the uh, Syrah wine has been served at the White House. <laughs> Well, well, we have one more question, my team tells me, so let's get this. Susan Hahn, not a political question, but curiosity. Any information on the preference of the president-elect? Yeah, what do we know about uh, Joe Biden or Dr. Biden and their uh, interest in wine? Well, uh, President-elect Biden uh, does not drink alcohol, but yeah. he, has, um, he has been the host over his years in, in public service of many formal sure. occasions. He's <laughs> toasted with heads of state. Uh, and Mrs. Biden is the, the uh, Dr. Biden at the entertainment at the uh, vice president's residence always made sure that the guests were welcome with great food and great entertainment and great wine. So I'm confident that the tradition of presidents and first ladies serving fine wines will continue uh, going forward in the next administration. It's a, it's really remarkable. I mean, Trump didn't drink. W didn't drink by the time he was president. Biden doesn't drink now. Uh, that's quite remarkable. I and mean, the first ladies will have to continue that tradition. I guess. Yep, three of uh, when when President Biden takes office, it will mean three of the past four presidents have been non-drinkers. Yeah, and even but, Obama, as you point out, is more of a beer guy. Even and he's yeah. not a heavy drinker or anything, obviously. So uh, fascinating. Um, but America has to. We have to keep it up for the industry here. We got to keep right. the wine flowing, keep the conversations going. This has been a lot of fun, Fred. I appreciate your time. I encourage. Everybody to go to the White House Historical Association, pick this up. You can also get it at the Mount Vernon shops, of course. And uh, make sure you have some wine next to you when you start reading it, because it, it really is a, it's a, it's a, uh, it, it's a dangerous, dangerous book, I think, in many ways. So, but what a lovely, beautiful book filled with incredible, incredible pictures, the White House and all these, these wonderful 
occasions. Uh, how many state dinners have you been at, Fred? Uh, I've been to, I guess going back to, I've been to three and, uh, and enjoy them very much. It's a, it's a, it's a great honor, a great occasion to, to be able to attend one. And, um, uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed it and I've taken notes on the wine and I, like you, I, I saved the menu card afterwards. Yeah. yeah, no, that's, it's a lot of fun to do that. Save the menus and, and research it later, recreate it with friends. Uh, they're, they're really special. Uh, I want to give you one opportunity also to show off that beautiful uh, etched glass that you have there. Well, well thank you. I, in yeah. addition to the book, one thing the White House Historical Association did was look back at the glassware that the White House has accumulated over the years of presidents of purchase and thought it might be fun to make some some variations of that available for, for people who want to consume wine. So this yeah. one here, if you can look at this has the this is uh, based on the design Franklin Roosevelt did. This version of the American Eagle, it was on, on the Williamsburg yacht. That's where he actually ordered this and served it. We also went back a century to a Republican president, Abraham Lincoln, and created a glass uh, with the Eagle, American Eagle as it was at that time, which is quite different. And then, of course, we have decanters and uh, uh, with both presidents for those who want to have that in their collection. But one last thing I mentioned, Doug, that people, you talked about the China, and you have a piece, and it's yeah. been ordered over the years. But glassware early on for presidents was a very important statement. It showed the world that we'd arrived and we could have mm -hmm. elegant things. But do you know that there has not been a single piece of glassware ordered for the White House since the Kennedy administration? Is so that, that right? state dinner that you were at for the, the wow. president of France, that's rented glassware from a catering service. Mm -hmm. So hopefully a future president will decide that the same way we showcase China, yeah. let's showcase great glassware and make that, it is part sad, of the that is sad to know i was drinking out of rented glassware oh my goodness unbelievable i thought it was a glass that was drunk in by benjamin harrison or something <laughs> <Yeah. No. laughs> well that's a shame that's great to know well thank you fred this has been a lot of fun stay on here as we end the live stream and uh i just uh, uh, thank you so much for your time really uh, congratulations and a phenomenal achievement this is going to be a great gift for years to come for people. Well, thank you, Doug. Great pleasure to be with you.